Thanks, George. And once again, as, and as others, I thank the organizers for uh, getting me involved in this meeting, which obviously has been great all day long. Um, I hope, <laughs> hope I can live up to the previous presentations. I got to warn you, I don't have anything like what Ken shows, though, but most of us don't. <laughs> so um, I was assigned the task of talking about special motor systems, and I had to think about what does that mean anyway? What, what motor system isn't special? And um, so I decided it would be no surprise to people who know the work I've done over the past for quite a while now, is what I want to talk to you about, though, is the evolutionary origins of novel cranial motor circuitry. I'm not going to be talking to you about spinal motor systems today, but about cranial motor circuitry. And integrating across multiple levels of analysis, behavioral, neurophysiological, um, uh, morphological, um, as a number of the other previous talks have done, and um, I'm going to focus on two functionally divergent but developmentally related motor systems. And those are the vocal system, which I've studied quite a bit for a number of years now, and the pectoral motor system, which is that system that runs the pectoral fins of fishes and our forelimbs. And, um, and I'll just tell you right off the bat, my, my goal is to um, talk about this in the context of of, in fact, that vocal systems may have evolved out of pectoral motor systems. And so, because we think about, well, where do these, quote unquote, special motor systems come from? Where do they arise from? And from a uh, number of things I've been doing recently, I think basically this system's coming out of the pectoral motor system, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting a reaction to that. So, I also want to thank, um, I'm one of those people who I work on fishes, and as some of the other speakers. For, my, for me, um, all the work I'll present to you really never would have been possible over a lot of years without the generosity of uh, several marine labs. The UC Bodega Marine Lab, you know, uh, which is um, part of UC Davis, where I've been working for like 25 years. Um, I have a small lab up there. Marine Biology Labs in Woods Hole and, the U and UW's Big Beef Creek um, Lab. Uh, field lab up in uh, Washington State, and with generous funding over the years from NIH, NSF, and help from Cornell as well. So this is the big picture. Um, uh, this is from a, uh, based on work that was done by Glenn and Carl Gans uh, when they were at the University of Michigan and when I was a grad student in Glenn's lab. And uh, this truly was the seduction of the innocent, right, Glenn? And um, <laughs> we. Glenn and Carl would, teach, would, would be teaching us all in their comparative anatomy courses about the evolution of vertebrates and what they thought was going on. And this is, um, most, many of you, I assume, are familiar with this paper, the uh, series of papers published in 1983. And what they proposed was that there were a, a, a number of innovations, novelties, that were linked to the protochordate vertebrate transition in terms of sensory systems and also motor systems, although most of their focus was on sensory systems, in particular neural crest, and what that meant to vertebrate nervous systems. And it was at that time that I got real interested in um, motor systems for social signaling. I, um, I totally enthralled with this story, but I was also someone who was very interested in communication and started back then wondering about where do signaling systems for social communication evolve from? Because certainly when you th we think about vertebrates, we think about ourselves, we think about all of those sophisticated mechanisms we have for communicating with our conspecifics. I'm going to tell you two stories. One is about the ancestry of vocal systems. Again, this has been my main one of the main areas of studies in my lab o over the years now. I'll come back to this more later. And then the second story is about ancestry of pectoral systems. And I want to point out from the very get-go here that um, based on fossil evidence, there's certainly strong evidence to support the fact that the pectoral system is very ancient. Pectoral fins evolved prior to pelvic fins, which is a later event. And I put vocal systems over here, although perhaps after today's, I go back and forth as to where they may actually have first appeared. We know, of course, the most about vocal systems among uh, bony vertebrates, which I'll be talking to you about quite a bit. But here we have pectoral fin motor systems, which clearly are the most ancient and are found in all vertebrate groups. 
Who are the main actors that I'll be telling you about? And there are two principal clades of bony vertebrates. There are the sarcopterygii, which include the coelacanth, several species of lungfish, and tetrapods. Um, as my colleague Harry Green always likes to remind to me and me to remind to audiences, we're all fishes. So don't forget that. Um, the other major group of bony vertebrates are the actinopterygii, or the ray fin fishes, which are the largest group of, the most speciose group of living vertebrates. Nearly half of all existing vertebrate species are actinopterygians. Harold's, the electric fish Harold was talking about, most of the fish you eat in restaurants all the time. Those are actinopterygii. And then, of course, another major group, more primitive group of vertebrates are the cartilaginous fishes, which are elasmobranch shark, uh, shark skates, rays. So keep that in mind as to the, the big picture here when we're talking about vertebrate evolution and, and appearance of motor systems. Another major part of the story I'll tell you about today are what are known as uh, rhombomeres. Rhombomeres are segments of the embryonic hindbrain. And uh, this is a, I love this picture. This is, um, this is from the thesis work of Ed Geeland, who's a, a colleague of mine. And Ed worked on dogfish uh, embryos. And what he's showing here, this is a scanning electron micrograph looking down on the developing hindbrain of a dogfish. And each of these little bumps is historically what was called a neuromere, or of course, in the case of the hindbrain or rhombencephalon, are known as rhombomeres. Visually, quite dramatic obvious, these bulges and valleys in the developing hindbrain. And what's shown here now is um, uh, it was really people, the resurgence, if you will, a renaissance in comparative developmental neurobiology in the 1980s was, of course, the work which demonstrated particular patterns of Hox gene expression in rhombomeres. And it was what was refer often referred to as a combinatorial code. And needless to say, there's <laughs> multiple, many papers every week coming out about Hox genes and, and hindbrain. I'm not going to be talking about other genes today. Um, I'll be talking about motor organization. And what's shown here now, this is from a review from Ed and Bob Baker that was um, Brain Behavior and Evolution. And what's shown here is a pattern of distribution of motor nuclei in the hindbrain, in this case, of a shark, of an embryonic shark. There's really more than six rhombomeres. There are eight rhombomeres invertebrates. And here are all the different motor neuron groups. I'm not going to go through them all, but basically what it shows is each motor nuclei arise from typically from pairs of rhombomeres. And from comparative, this is a comparative review. What's important, so here we have um, lamprey, jawless vertebrate, sharks, teleos, so cartilaginous actinopterygian fishes. The pattern is more or less stable. There are some nuances and variation from group to group. But the pattern of distribution of motor nuclei across rhombomeres, these are, again, these are, these are all horizontal views. You're looking down on the developing hindbrain. It's more or less a fairly stable pattern across all of these groups. And it's equally conserved and stable a pattern across sarcopterygii as well. So I refer to this as a blueprint for vertebrates. Again, there is some variation here, but for the most part, this is a highly stable developmental pattern. And the question, though, became, oh, typo there, but where are the vocal and pectoral motor systems within this framework? And that's a major question I want to address. So let's talk about the first story, about vocal acoustic signaling. Vocal acoustic signaling is widespread among all, most of the major lineages of vertebrates. Um, including fishes. Um, it, it, there's, there's one of the most predominant forms of social communication that's evolved among verts. Many of the wonderful sounds you hear all the time. The first commentary, I'll be talking about fishes, and Socrates, of course, who, remarkable individual, commented on um, sound production by fishes. I love this quote. The apparent voice in all these fishes is a sound caused in some cases by a rubbing motion of their gills, which by the, by the way are prickly. Those nice little stingers. Must have had midshipman fish or something. Like that. Or in other cases by internal parts about their bellies. For they all have air or wind inside them by rubbing and moving which they produce the sounds. 
These are basically swim bladder mechanisms that he was referring to. This is from a comparative overview. This is work from, uh, from John's lab. John, I don't see where you are. <laughs> and, um, uh, but this is, uh, Aaron Rice was a postdoc in my lab. And what he did is he took a super tree that was developed from um, um, Judith Monk when she was in, in John's lab. And this is, I think, is 55 different orders of living actinopterygian fishes. So these are the ray fin fishes. This is one of the major clades of bony vertebrates, the others being ourselves and lungfish and coelacanth. And what Aaron's done here, um, along with uh, two colleagues, um, Ingrid Katz and, and Phil Obel, is map out the distribution of where there's evidence for sound production among fishes. And I was also astounded by this when I first saw it. Um, evidence that in set over 70% of living vertebrate orders of these fishes, there's evidence for sound production. The deep sea fishes stand out. Needless to say, no one's ever really investigated them at all. So sound production among the largest group of living vertebrates is widespread. The principal mechanism that these vertebrates use for um, making sound is what's known as a swim bladder, sonic swim bladder system. So um, most ray fin fishes have a swim bladder, a gas-filled bladder, which is a separate organ system from, uh, from the pharynx from which it develops. And that gas is, contact can be is controlled by what's known as a red gland. The other major, this, is, this number here is actually up to about 700 now. And this is now another form of, of, of sound production is stridulation. So in a swim bladder mechanism, the swim bladder is vibrating. It more or less acts like a drum, which is what it's often been referred to as drumming muscles that vibrate it. Stridulation, typically, it's the grinding or the movement together of pectoral fins, pectoral fin spines, pectoral fin tendons. Uh, many of you know about here, maybe you've heard uh, croaking gouramis. That's the snapping of pectoral fin tendons that makes the sound they produce. So most of the stridulation mechanisms are pectoral derived. There are other forms also reported. Most of these systems, this is a sonic swim bladder system, which I'm going to tell you about. Now, um, my interest in this whole area, or I should say the first publication that even began to address what I'm going to talk to you about today, was back in 1997. Um, this was a, an overview that I wrote with a colleague, Bob Baker. And um, it began to address this whole issue of the evolution of social signaling mechanisms. And, um, and what I'm showing here, for example, is vocal communication systems, frogs, birds, fishes. Here's the swim bladder of fishes that they use to make sound. You remember that, so the principal organ of sound production in birds is the syrinx. In frogs, as in ourselves and, and many other tetrapods, is the larynx. I've also included here our, our electric fish, uh, which I had studied for a number of years, and electromotor systems, because the, what the hypothesis that was put forward, and at that time, back in 97, um, this is really all based on adult phenotypes and proposals of where these systems would be developing. And what's shown here are several nuclei, which I'll tell you more about in a moment, that are involved in pattern generation, production of sound in fishes. Um, this is the electromotor system. In this case, the motor neurons are down in the spinal cord. And in the sonic fish system, the motor neurons are in the hindbrain as they are in birds and, and other tetrapods. But the pattern generating machinery, the machinery that underlies the rhythmic production of sonic signals, no matter what vertebrate group you're talking about, as is the case with electromotor signals, which as Harold showed you, some of his recordings are highly rhythmic as well. That's where these neurons are located, and the proposal was that's where these systems have evolved and developed. Um, what's also shown here is the inferior olive, which in many would regard as perhaps the highest order pacemaker system in the brain, providing climbing fiber input to the cerebellum. These are various nuclei that are involved in eye movements in vertebrates. Also, um, these neurons, and in all these cases, these, these neuronal groups, some of them include neurons that are produce rhythm, rhythms. They're oscillatory. Uh, this is a case I'll show you more in a moment from actually our fish. This is just from recent work, recordings for what we refer to as pacemaker neurons. But the goal, the idea here being that rhythmic circuitry in vertebrates evolved in this caudal part of the hindbrain. 
This is um, now. Just to show you my little t contribution to videos today. Um, this is a humming midshipman fish. These fish are nocturnal. Um, any of you, this is one of your neighbors here in California. They, they populate the intertidal zone um, in Northern California every summer and spring uh, to produce a mate call. That's their mate call. Rather attractive call, right? And they produce this at night. And so this is from a video that was made, um, using inf made a long time ago using you know, um, regular video with low level red lighting. Um, but this is their swim bladder. And these are the, this is weird, George. You're right about the, there it is. Um, mm, right there. That's the muscle that they use to, to create sound. It's known as a sonic muscle or drumming muscle. These are the fastest contracting vertebrate muscles that are known. They're going, that sound, the fundamental frequency of that sound is 100 hertz, and those muscles are contracting at 100 hertz. That's at about 16, 15, 16 degrees centigrade. These are really fast muscles. These kinds of muscles have now been identified. This is uh, um, in, in echolocating bats and, and in, the syrin in the larynx of echolocating bats, as well as in the syrinx of songbirds. These are found in a number of vocal systems. And what's shown over here is a side view of the embryonic brain of a midshipman fish. And this is at the back end of the skull. This is the occipital vertebral boundary right here. And this is, um, I'll tell you more about it in a moment, but the bottom line is here, this is what's known as the occipital foramen. And out of that occipital foramen come uh, a pair of occipital nerve roots. These are considered to be homologs of the hypoglossal nerve of, of other vertebrates. And this, these set of roots provide input to what's known as the hypobranchial muscles. Think of it in terms of your cells as tongue musculature, to the vocal musculature of these fishes, and to the pectoral fin. So you have a group of nerve roots here which innervate muscles, and these muscles share embryonic origins in fishes and other vertebrates. This is the brain of a fish, of the midshipman fish that we studied for a long time. This is the inner ear, uh, forebrain, midbrain, uh, cerebellum, hindbrain. And what you see here, these are these two occipital root, two roots that carry vocal motor axons. They are what give rise to the nerve that goes to that muscle, that sonic muscle. And what's attracted me to working on them part, for so many years, in part, is here's a natural call. This is actually an example of, this is another kind of call that they make that's known as a grunt. Um, it's an agonistic call. And I just play that in part just to remind people. So pe this is what people typically think of a fish making noises. But these signals have a social context. They use an aggression, as opposed to that other signal, which has very different properties that's used in mate calling. So fishes have dynamic repertoires of sound, depending on the social context in which they're using it. This is the call here. Let me get this out of the way. And what's here, this is a recording from an occipital nerve root. And what you see is, this is what we'd refer to as a fictive vocalization. This recording, you can see just from here, and this is an expansion of a single recording, mimics the natural call's temporal properties to, 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 to exactly. So that the output of this system is predictive of natural calls and their, and their duration as well as their frequency. Each of these represents, it's a single spike-like potential that represents a synchronous firing of motor neurons on that side of the brain that drive the muscle on the same side. And the periodicity of each of these spikes is matched one-to-one -one with a single muscle contraction, which is matched one-to-one -one with a sound pulse. And so the rate of this is entirely predictive of the temporal properties of the natural call. Over the years, um, worked by a number of people, including Jim Goodson, who's going to follow me here. Blast from the past, Jim. Um, is, um, uh, this is Midge Marchetier, uh, who works in my lab, Jim Goodson and Matt Kittleberger. And working with them over the years, we've constructed what I refer to as the song control system of fishes. And um, as was pointed out in a paper that Jim did while he was in the lab, the overall pattern of organization of this system, this song control system, is most similar to what you find in mammals, including primates. 
And I'm going to focus your attention for now, though, again, on what's happening here at the back end of the brain. This is the midbrain. It's comparable to the midbrain periaqueductal gray. And here we are in the anterior hypothalamus um, preoptic area. Now, this is the most recent work uh, done with Boris Chagnot, who was uh, up to recently a postdoc in my lab, he's now at the University of Munich, and a long my longtime colleague, Bob Baker. And in this case, what Boris uh, did is he, using better methods, better electrodes, went back in and studied the properties of the motor nucleus in the hindbrain. So this is at the level of the caudal hindbrain. This, these motor neurons go to that muscle and drive it. Those neurons, in turn, are get input from what's known as a pacemaker nucleus. I borrowed this terminology from electric fish, which I had worked with for a long time. But you'll see why we call it a pacemaker nucleus. And then that nucleus, in turn, gets input from simply calling a pre-pacemaker nucleus. The output of that system is what generates that nerve output, which, again, when you see something like that, that's the nerve firing. Think of it, it is the natural sound. That essentially is a grunt that the animal's producing. All right. And what's shown here now, this is, these are intracellular recordings of the motor neurons. So for example, here's a recording from a single motor neuron shown here. And each of those action potentials is matched one to one with each spike that you record in the nerve itself. And so the activity of a single motor neuron is a predictive of all the, of the temporal properties of the entire call, in fact. Those neurons, I'm not going to go through the details of any of the physiology. I just want like, to show the picture sometimes. Um, this is, again, from Boris's work. Um, what's shown here is the black here is the cell body of a pacemaker neuron. It has a wide dendritic arborization. These are reconstructions of individually filled cells. The red represents the axon of that cell. The, the, this, the, 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 uh, what this, this cell does for a living is it innervates and drives those motor neurons. And these neurons, these are recordings here, these neurons have generate sub-threshold membrane oscillations. And if you drive the cell more, each of these turns into an action potential. And it is essentially those oscillatory properties that determine the firing properties of this pacemaker neuron, which in turn determines the rate of firing of the motor neurons. And um, Boris has a paper out that, that explains much of this. I'm not going to get into the detail on it. So we have a pacemaker nucleus driving the motor nucleus. And the big picture is, the, again, I don't, I don't have the time to go through the details for this today. The pre-pacemaker nucleus, other, evidence, other study recordings that Boris did, showed that it essentially encodes what the duration of the call will be. The neurons in this pre-pacemaker nucleus generate what are known as sustained depolarizations. And the duration of that depolarization is what predicts, or determines, rather, the, the duration of firing of the pacemaker neurons which in turn determine the firing frequency of the motor neuron. So this system together, duration, frequency, and from other unpublished work that's in review right now from Boris, the motor neurons essentially are determining the amplitude of the call. So you have essentially, in fishes at least, you have a simple compartmentalization for all of the principal attributes of the natural behavior determined back here in the hindbrain. You can surgically isolate this part of the brain and you can demonstrate that everything you need to generate a natural call is located there. That's not to say that that call isn't modulated by things happening upstream. But all of the, all of the pattern generating machinery that you need to do it is clearly positioned right here. Uh, there's also, these neurons are interesting in that these are the neurons that send a message to the auditory system to let the auditory system know that a sound is going to produce. This is essentially the corollary discharge in this system. And uh, there's other work that Boris has done to demonstrate that, in fact, these neurons are, are in fact, um, encoding the vocal signal itself. So a hindbrain vocal network. Working with Ed Gilland at Howard University. This is Omi Ma. He just sent me this picture last week. He got his green card. He was so happy. So he sent this picture. I said, I need a picture of Omi to show. So I thought it was perfect, actually. Uh, he was a postdoc in Bob Baker's lab and uh, Midge Marshater as well. And over the years, working with them, been involved in a number of projects um, on the early development of the hindbrain circuitry in these fishes. The first major paper on this came out a few years ago. 
And essentially what, what I did here was um, I went in and labeled uh, using fluorescent dextran dyes different parts of the developing nervous system. So these are experiments that I did on larval midshipman fishes, which, I collected up in, uh, which we collected up in Bodega Bay area here. And went in and, for example, um, in this experiment, went in and put, it, uh, put a dextrin dye into the spinal cord. If you do this in fishes, what you reveal, this is, these are different populations of neurons located in every rhombomere that essentially project down to the spinal cord. They're running the spinal machinery. It's referred to in fishes as a reticulospinal system, uh, which is essentially a scaffold that is an additional scaffold in the developing hindbrain but you can, that you can use to identify the different rhombomeres, along with populations of motor neurons. In this case, what I did was I, and I did that for landmarks, to know exactly where every rhombomere was. And here I labeled the developing sonic muscle, which I could get at in these small embryos, based on earlier studies. And the bottom line is what this shows here is that this vocal motor nucleus is developing in a part of rhombomere 8. Rhombomere 8 in fishes and birds in particular is two to three times larger than any of the other rhombomeres. It's different in its size. And what I have here, this is just a summary of many experiments mapping out the position of different motor neuron groups. This is the inferior olive in the hindbrain. Basically, these embryology experiments supported the hypothesis that was put forward back in that paper in 1997. But these were actually real experiments to support that idea. Here's the vocal machinery. Um, working with later stage larvae, I was able to label the pre-paced pacemaker and pre-pacemaker neurons as well. All of these neurons are developing back here in this part of the hindbrain. And in fact, at the hindbrain spinal junction is where they're occurring. What's also here is I also at that time labeled pectoral motor neuron groups. And honestly, part of the reason I did that is because it was easy to do. And I figured, OK, I'll label another motor neuron group and show that it, figuring it's separate from the vocal motor nucleus. But the surprise there, in fact, at that time was it was sitting right up here. We'd all always learned or assumed the pectoral fins are run by a, those are spinal motor neurons. I mean, we think about forelimbs and foreland, our own pectoral appendages. Those spinal motor neurons, those neurons, motor neurons are down in the spinal cord. But it, this suggested that in fishes, something else might be going on. So just keep that in mind. Comparatively speaking, taking this map and then looking at the literature that was out there, fortunately, early development literature from Luis Poilus on birds, um, from actually um, Hans Straka um, and Ed Gillen working on frogs, and unfortunately, the, 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 the smallest amount of literature out there on early development of this part of the hindbrain is on primates and mammals. But in fact, if you look at the adult phenotype in mammals and primates, the organization of the circuitry running the larynx is just the way it is in the same part of the brain as in these other systems. So here's our vocal system with premotor neurons and the motor neurons, the pattern generating machinery. That's important to keep in mind, not just the motor neurons. In birds, these are what are known, these they're, they're work here. This is the hypoglot, this is the part of the hypoglossal nucleus that goes to the syrinx in birds. It's the back end of the hypoglossal nucleus. These are um, vagal motor neurons that go to the larynx and frogs. They're at the back end of the vagal motor nucleus in frog, uh, that whole column in frogs. This is our nucleus ambiguous. And the neurons going to the vocal apparatus are at the caudal end of nucleus ambiguous. And in fact, there are neuronal groups caudal to ambiguous, which are pat involved in pattern generation of our own signals. So I refer to this as a compartment for vocalization that is shared among all vertebrate groups. And it led to this figure here, um, proposing that, in fact, there is this compartment that's, that's, that's fairly ancient in vertebrates, that the vocal system has evolved out of this caudal set of rhombomeres, and this, or this hindbrain spinal compartment, across all vertebrate groups. Now, immediately, you notice, though, well, birds are using a syrinx. We use a larynx. Frogs use a larynx. These fishes are using a different, you know, there are different skeletal elements obviously deployed in producing these signals for, uh, I'm sure, a variety of biomechanical reasons. Uh, this is a dense figure, I know, but this is from my colleague Drew Noden at Cornell, who a number of years ago, with his work, really transformed our idea of how the mesoderm in the head develops. And what's, these are what are known as the occipital somites. 
positioned here, all the musculature that arises from that, including tongue musculature and intrinsic laryngeal muscles coming out of here. And in addition, this is where syringeal muscle comes from, other more recent work, as well as the muscles of the swim bladder of these fishes. And so if you separate your brain from the skeletal things that are involved here, the musculature running all these vocal systems share a developmental origin. And so in the end, what have fish told us about the ancestry of vocalization? One is that the behaviors are ancient, the muscles share developmental origins, and the pattern generators also share origins. What about the pectoral system? This is an actual dissection of this preparation. Here are the occipital roots. And again, here's the vocal component. There's a branch from each part of each of these occipital roots that gives rise, rise to the vocal nerve. And I showed you the recordings from those roots. But then there's the pectoral branch here. And along with a single spinal branch, it innervates the pectoral musculature. In the interest of time, right, I have another 10 minutes if I stick to your 40. Is that it? Um, this, is what, this is the craniovertebral junction. This is a cleared midshipman embryo. Here's the swim bladder. Uh, developing. This is a larval midshipman, excuse me. And what's shown here now in zebrafish, this is an expression of a particular gene known as HOXB4A. And HOXB4A demarcates the hindbrain spinal boundary, um, clearly one of the advantages of working with zebrafish. What we did was, and this is the work, not we, this is the work of Omi Ma, um, who clearly has some of the most incredible set of hands when it comes to working with fish embryos. And what Omi did was, this is a midshipman embryo. This is the developing neuroepithelium here. This is the fourth ventricle, the developing ear. Each of these is a myotome. Omi went in and labeled the developing fin buds with a dextran dye. And that enabled him to localize where the neurons are that go to the pectoral fin the developing pectoral fin. And if you map do these similar, and here they are shown here. This is a side view of the brain. Each of these are branches of the occipital roots and a single spinal. So just like in that dissection I showed you, this is where the motor nucleus is positioned that goes to the pectoral fins. It is positioned in exactly the same place as the vocal motor nucleus in these fishes developing fishes. And in fact, what Omi did then also is he labeled each of these myotomes with a dye to identify all the motor neurons that go to musculature derived from those myotomes. And that enabled him to identify the entire occipital column as well. And there's a single occipital pectoral column in the developing hindbrain of these fishes. And we looked at the embryos of a number of different species, advantage of being at Cornell, getting, having people that can help you find paddlefish embryos and salmon embryos. Um, and the bottom line being, in all of these distantly related groups of actinopterygian fishes, you see this consistent pattern of occipital pectoral column. And keep in mind, this is, and this is exactly the neurons that are giving rise, this, these occipital neurons, this extends back here are giving rise to the vocal neurons as well. So a shared developmental origin for those neurons. Other things we, that we did in these fishes, this is from zebrafish again. There are lines of zebrafish which label all the motor neurons, um, except for pectoral motor neurons. And we label them here, along with these are neurons that go to the cerebellum. The only reason I show you this is using multiple neuronal groups to reconstruct the embryonic hindbrain of distantly related groups of fishes. For what purpose? To demonstrate that, in fact, this is a stable pattern of organization across all of these groups of fishes. It's not just one teleos found in this particular group. We specifically chose distantly related groups to try to get at the issue, at least of what is a shared pattern for, for teleos in terms of a basal pattern. OK? I'm not going to get into the details of that. But um, it was essentially impossible to find a Glenn would truly appreciate this one, the difficulty of finding ratfish embryos. Uh, but this is an elasmobranch or lungfish embryos to work with. Lungfish being an example of a sarcopterygian, a lung dipnoi. Um, ratfish, a cartilaginous fishes, because we wanted to expand our analysis to other vertebrate groups. But what is shown here, this is again Omi's handiwork. These are dissections of embryos, of, of larvae of these fishes, and showing all the occipital spinal innervation. The bottom line being, um, 
and identifying where they're coming out in terms of the cranial vertebral junction. The pattern exactly matches everything that we found in teleost embryos and fairly confident that this pattern is shared across both all these fishes, and that's the purpose of this slide. And actually, thanks to a monograph uh, by Willie Bemis and Glenn, along with Milo and Anthony, we could get in information about latimeria as well in terms of the innervation of those, those, that musculature. But the important message, so here's a pectoral compartment. I should have, ma should have made this differently to include the occipitals as well, obviously, at that time, but this was mainly about pectoral. It's sitting here at the hindbrain spinal junction, moving pectoral fins of fishes. This compartment has essentially moved into the spinal cord in tetrapods. All right, that's a transformative event. If you look at the Hox pattern of Hox gene expression, of the mesoderm that gives rise to the pectoral fins or to forelimb musculature, or you look at what was available at that time about Hox expression in the neurons, pectoral fin neurons, or forelimb motor neurons, they're highly similar, suggesting there is an instructional code that's coding for a pectoral module, both in the mesoderm as well as the nervous system. And this whole module appears to have moved into the spinal cord among tetrapods. This caudal shift, tectolic, arises again. Harold. So this is from a summary diagram from Alberg and Clack, but many of you have heard about this story through Neil Shubin's beautiful work, on, um, along with Deschler and Ferris Jenkins. Looking at the proposed evolution of the neck, and essentially what's going on here. So in fishes, this is the key issue, actually. In fishes, the pectoral fins are attached to the back of the skull. That's, the fossil record shows that as well. These one major hypothesis, they evolved essentially for balance, steering, postural adjustments. Our, obviously, our forelimbs, our pectoral appendages are not attached to the back of our skull. They're uncoupled. And that uncoupling event is linked to the evolution of a neck. And we can think of all the advantages of that. But what were the, this is from one of his, uh, Neil Schubert, this, this time his book came out. It's a great book to read, um, Your Inner Fish. Um, um, that does capture the essence of the story here in many ways. And, but what other innovations occurred? And my premise would be, in fact, with the shift of this circuitry into the spinal cord, we see the elaboration of the complex laryngeal and syringeal systems of tetrapods. Uh, I'm not, of course, I'm not going to state that the sounds of fishes are as complex as they are or no of others. But what are the events that have shaped the evolution of those complex vocal systems in tetrapods? There are major events that have transformed this part of the central nervous system. There's the movement of this pectoral system out of there and the elaboration of those other systems. Those are some of the slides I pulled, George, to cut down. So what I would propose is that what, what's fascinating is that links between sonic or vocal systems and pectoral systems for social si signaling are found in both fishes and tetrapods. Fishes, this is from a review article I did with Fritz Lodek, a colleague who works quite a bit on sound production in fishes. And in fishes, as I pointed out earlier, it's not only that sonic swim bladders are the major mechanism of making sound, those muscles that share developmental origins with laryngeal and syringeal muscles, but in addition, often that swim bladder is working with the pectoral fins, the pectoral girdle, to create sounds. And sometimes they're independent. Some fishes are just using their pectoral girdle, vibrating it. That's what sculpin do. Sculpin don't even have a swim bladder, but they vibrate their pectoral girdle to generate a sound. It's, it's rampant, this association, sonic, pectoral, or the two together, across all fishes. And I would argue is it, it, it reflects, really, I think, the shared developmental origin of those two motor systems. And some of you may be familiar with some of the beautiful work that's been done on mannequins. This is from work of Kim Boswick, uh, who's at Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology, talking about mannequins and the mechanical sounds that mannequins, mannequins have a set of secondary feathers that they use to produce sounds. And these are acoustic, these are sonic co communication signals. So even, I mean, look what I'm doing up here, right? I always feel, moving my hand. A friend of mine said, you should point that out. I'm not only speaking, but I'm gesturing all the time. But you know, maybe there really is something to this association. Um, 
Tecumseh Fitch, who's written quite a bit about the evolution of language, he wrote, theoretically, language might have originally been encoded gesturally rather than vocally. This is a prevalent idea among linguists. And in fact, there may be some real substance to this in terms of the evolutionary history of the motor systems that are deployed and used for sound production in fishes themselves and in other, in other vertebrates. And so you have this module, this spectral vocal sonic module evolving here in fishes, which undergoes a number of changes um, further on. And so um, I was talking to Paul this morning about this. And he, he said, well, how do you know? Maybe the social signaling stuff is as ancient as the pectoral fins. We all think of the pectoral fins evolved for postural control. Well, maybe they evolved for purposes of display behaviors, is what he pointed out. I would say they probably evolved for both. And what this suggests, based on this fossil evidence, it may indeed be that these systems for social signaling are very ancient. And my proposal, therefore, being that these vocal systems evolved out of the pectoral motor system. That indeed is the more ancient system. But I do believe it's actually a tractable question. One can ask this question in fishes, for sure, um, about the origins. I mean, going back and doing more early development studies to track exactly, I mean, because the, the key question here, right, is, well, what is it that specifies some group or within that pectoral, occipital pectoral column Again, what is it that specifies that they will become vocal neurons? Um, I think this is the question that Nipon was talking about this morning in many ways. Um, that's, of course, where the genetics will become especially important. But um, that, I would say, is, is, is my principal message about what's going on here. And we can approach it in another way. It's important to ask the question, though. These are actually recordings. George, how much time what am I doing? OK. If you look at the temporal output of the vocal system of fishes, the frogs look exactly the same. This is a laryngeal motor system. The output of that system and its temporal properties are no different than sonic fishes. Again, so to, it doesn't matter what the peripheral mechanism is that's being used. The central mechanism and what's going on is highly conserved. These are recordings from axial musculature, uh, zebrafish, turtles, um, from Ari Berkowitz and David McLean's lab at Northwestern. Very, not that there isn't synchrony in all motor systems, but it's a very different temporal patterned output. And the little that is available out there, there were studies done in the 60s by Mike Bennett on actually on a group of fishes called hatchet fish. And they have this incredible escape response. And what he showed, in fact, synchrony, similar level of synchrony is found in that pectoral system as is shown here. Um, it's not the same level of analysis as what we've done. We need to go back and do that. But the evidence is there to support the hypothesis, at least in terms of the traits of the adult phenotypes. The question still remains is to get at the genetic and early developmental basis of that. But I would propose it is the reason that there's a, there's a history here as to why pectoral type systems have been selected for in terms of generating vocal signals. And a hallmark of vocal signals is precise temporal structure. You don't see that in other motor systems. So I'll stop there. Thanks.